Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we focus on the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors in Northern California and the recent announcement by Pacific Gas and Electric that they plan to shut down these earthquake fault adjacent reactors by 2025 and replace them by renewables. Sounds good. We'll find out how good it actually is. We talk again with Linda Seeley of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace and then with the inimitable Harvey Wasserman of Solartopia and so much more. We discuss the issues, the weaknesses of the agreement, and the deep politics churning behind the scenes. Both of these activists have been on the front lines of this issue for over 40 years, so they bring to the discussion a depth of understanding, along with a knowledge of where the bodies are buried. Plus, our ever-cheeky numbnuts of the week, the nuclear reactor duck, and cover report, and more honest information than anyone in England thought about before voting for Brexit. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 28, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Last week, as Nuclear Hot Seat was already in production and actually almost done with production, we learned that Pacific Gas and Electric had entered into an agreement that it would be closing the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors, yay, at the end of their current licenses in 2024 and 2025, eight and nine years from now. Mm, less than yay, but okay, that's where it stands for now. PG&E also said that they would replace the energy from Diablo Canyon with renewables. This settlement confirmed expert testimony submitted by Mothers for Peace in 2015, which PG&E disputed at that time, that the power from Diablo Canyon can easily be replaced with solar, wind, wave, and geothermal energy. We spoke with Linda Seeley about the upcoming meeting with the California Lands Commission, which is scheduled for today, June 28, 2016, which offered the hope that the shutdown of the nuclear reactors could be moved up to as early as 2018 and 2019. The two featured interviews that we have today focus on that issue, and that's the best way for you to gain this information. They'll be coming up in just a few minutes. Also on Diablo Canyon from fukuleaks.org, researchers with that respected archive and website have discovered that Diablo Canyon may have leaked significant radioactivity in recent years. Unusual spikes were discovered on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's RADNET monitors at the Bakersfield, California station in late 2014 and early 2015. FukuLeaks pulled multiple years of back data, including data prior to the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, to confirm that these spikes were indeed unusual for this station. They then found that the spikes correlated with activities at Diablo Canyon. We're going to have a link up so that you can take a look at the charts yourself and check out the numbers. It will be at NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 262. That's where we will also have a link up to an article about earthquake dangers at Diablo Canyon worsened by fracking. But if you think we're done with Diablo Canyon for this week, wait, there's more! Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Amazing what a billionaire can buy. The pro-nuclear workers at Diablo Canyon have been traveling to that meeting at the California Lands Commission in Sacramento, and they're going in style. Chartered air-conditioned bus, three meals a day provided, Entertainment, Brazilian martial arts lessons, morning yoga and calisthenics, swimming, crafts, campfire, sing-alongs, and s'mores. They call themselves a march, but in order to march, you gotta, well, march. 
But these guys are getting bussed to locations where they then walk for 3.8 miles one day, 2.8 the next, and hey, the last day, two whole miles. Oh, man, what a grind. That's not a march. It's a stroll. Trust it from somebody who ran a marathon. They get side trips, lectures, tree climbing, music. Shoot, this is summer camp for adults. Everything fully paid for, including their salaries. No vacation time required. Well, who wouldn't want to demonstrate for nuclear under these conditions? And, of course, it all ends with, as they so smarmily listed it on their itinerary, pack the room at the Lands Commission meeting. What really hurts is how these deluded ignoramuses don't even understand what they are doing. A statement on their website shows the extent of their ignorance. It reads, We won't be able to look our future grandchildren in the eyes and tell them that we did all we could to safeguard their future and protect clean energy unless we do. Now that sounds like something that you or I or any one of us would write. Except these people are talking about protecting nuclear. That's their idea of clean energy. And, of course, when they talk about grandchildren, they actually expect to have them and that they're healthy. And they do not understand the disproportionate way that women and children, especially girls and fetuses and the reproductive system, is damaged down to the DNA by nuclear radiation from these bombs and tea kettles. While I never want to be able to say to anybody regarding nuclear, I told you so. To these smug tools of the 1%, I think it only appropriate that I wish that they would have a choking fit on their s'mores. And that's why all of you deluded fools who went to summer camp to support the nuclear madness of Diablo Canyon, all of you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Word comes from Karen Haddon and the Seed Coalition that the Texas Democratic Party, that you didn't think they had one down there, but I guess they do, the Texas Democratic Party does not consent to a plan that would bring the nation's dangerous, high-level radioactive waste to West Texas. During its convention in San Antonio last week, the party debated a resolution opposed to the plan by Waste Control Specialist, WCS, in Andrews, Texas, to expand its low-level radioactive waste storage site to accept high-level radioactive waste. The Democratic Party's resolution cites risks of water contamination, security concerns, and transportation accidents as reasons to oppose the plan, which was passed by 29 county conventions and is now part of the 2016 Texas Democratic Party platform. Vermont Yankee may be shut down, but nuclear waste is the gift that keeps on giving. It's nuclear's dirty little secret. Several times a week, a tanker truck leaves Vermont Yankee carrying 5,000 gallons of tritium-tainted groundwater. But hey, there's a more convenient solution to that because energy administrators and state officials have begun discussing the idea of discharging the contaminated liquid into the nearby Connecticut River. Oh, joy. Vermont Yankee spokesmodel Marty Cohen said, We're looking to see if, in fact, it's a viable option. There's no plan for discharges now. There's no proposal for that. It's an option we are exploring. Oh, get off it. You know you're planning on doing it. You're just trying to weasel it in. Which brings us to this week's duck <laughs> and cover report. We've got our ducks in a row, and the line is long. At Entergy's Fitzpatrick in New York on June 24th, it was the start of a doubleheader. First, a full scram smacked it down from full power to zero because of reactor recirculation pump degradation. Then on June 26 at Fitzpatrick, an oil spill was reported, even though the thing was at zero power. The main turbine lubricating oil was leaking out. And how well does your car work when it's leaking oil? <coughs> Grand Gulf in Mississippi on June 25th. 
an automatic reactor scam due to a turbine trip, taking it from 99% power to zero. Just smack on the brakes when you're going 100. See what that does for your car. <coughs> Exelon's Clinton in Illinois on June 24th. Secondary containment was declared inoperable. And the loss of secondary containment is reportable as an event or condition that could have prevented fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material. <coughs> Energy's Indian Point in New York on June 24th shut down due to leaking weld. And that's this week's duck <coughs> and cover report. Over to Japan, where on Tuesday, June 28th, TEPCO said in a massive understatement that a power outage had halted some systems. Dig through the article a little bit, and you learn that an alarm sounded at 3.40 a.m. on Tuesday, and that's when workers found a unit that filters radioactive cesium from contaminated water had shut down. Oops! Also affected was cooling equipment for an underground ice wall, a.k.a. the saltwater slushy, which is still being set up around four reactor buildings in a bid to restrict the flow of groundwater beneath them. An epic, ongoing fail and money sink. But TEPCO said no abnormalities were detected with this equipment or in the surrounding environment. Of course there were no abnormalities, just Three melted down wrecks of nuclear reactors, 600 tons of missing plutonium laced fuel, and the saltwater slushy. Nope, no abnormalities here. Just another day for TEPCO. Then there's TEPCO's admission of a highly contaminated water leak from a water storage tank on June 26. All beta nuclide density was reported at 96 million becquerels per cubic meter. And remember, this kind of tank has unwelded joint parts, which are vulnerable to leakage. The life of the tanks is reported to be five years. It's been five years since Fukushima, and these tanks have been up almost that long. Can't wait to see what happens next. The recently restarted Ui power plant in Fukui Prefecture registered two alarms indicating trouble with electric power cables between late Saturday and early Sunday. No glitches have been found, and the utility, Kansai Electric Power Company, has tried to fob off the problem as a radio signal that monitors the connection conditions of the cables was temporarily interrupted due to an unstable atmosphere. BS, BS, BS. Define unstable atmosphere. Is it a breeze? Is it a tornado? Or is it just the ongoing problem of nukes? The Japanese researchers who published the frequently quoted study of the mutational effects of Fukushima's radiation on blue butterflies have gotten their research grant withdrawn. Thanks a lot, Takahashi Industrial and Economic Research Foundation. In England, the UK's Brexit vote is being labeled as the final nail in the coffin for an 18 billion pound project to build a new power station at Hinkley Point. This according to Paul Dorfman, an honorary senior research fellow at the Energy Institute, University College, London. Dr. Dorfman said, how is France going to invest in the UK if the UK is no longer part of the Union? He went on to say, not only that, but the French nuclear industry has huge financial problems and unions are screaming that they don't want Hinkley Point. And in Mexico, didn't know Mexico was a nuclear country, but there you have it. A used fuel storage installation at Laguna Verde Nuclear Power Plant has been built in a mere 16 months instead of the three years that it's supposed to take. You never want to speed build at a nuclear facility. Built by Holtec International, makers of the thin canister tin cans that are being foisted on the American public, according to Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety, these canisters are even worse than the ones that have been foisted on the San Onofre nuclear waste and the customers of Southern California Edison. Que lastima! We will have our featured interviews in just a moment, but first, my ongoing thanks to all of you who help support Nuclear Hot Seat. Whether you choose to buy the show a cup of coffee, what I call the Starbucks donation, 
choose to make your Starbucks donation a monthly recurring donation, or you are able to contribute something larger. Everything counts towards covering our expenses, and as always, the kind words you share help keep me in good heart. So as we move into year six of this international show, please help keep Nuclear Hot Seat going as a show you can depend upon for verifiable nuclear news, slam-bang interviews, and a whole bunch of anti-nuclear attitude. To donate now, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever you can do to help, it is necessary, appreciated, and I am truly grateful to you. Activist shout-out! Donna Gilmore of SanOnofreSafety.org is looking for some activists fluent in Spanish to help translate information into Spanish for Mexico, especially the information on Holtec canisters, and also more general information for Spanish speakers here in California. If you can help with this, maybe as part of a team of translators, you can reach Donna through the contact link at SanOnofreSafety.org. Y gracias por su ayuda. No, not me. That's as far as my Spanish goes. Both of this week's interviews focus on Diablo Canyon and the announcement by Pacific Gas and Electric last week that they would be closing that two-reactor nuclear facility at the end of their licenses in 2024 and 2025. Two weeks ago, on the Nuclear Hot Seat 5th Anniversary Program, we spoke with Linda Seeley of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace about what was then an upcoming meeting on Diablo Canyon with the California Lands Commission. There was a real chance for forcing the shutdown to take place by 2019, not having to wait until 2025. In this interview, recorded last Sunday, June 26, 2016, Linda covers the Mothers for Peace plans and hopes for that meeting. Linda Seeley, first of all, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat, and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> we'll talk about the congratulations. That's the big question. PG&E made this announcement, but it's eight or nine years away. So in terms of what they actually said and what this actually means, how good is it? We have to look at it from the big picture and then from the details. Big picture, it's great. As it stands right now, it appears that California is going to be nuclear-free in nine years. Yahoo, that's a wonderful thing. We don't need the nuclear power. We don't need it today. California happens to be the sixth largest economy in the world, and according to the deal, the power from Diablo Canyon is going to be replaced with renewable energy. So what could be better than that? That's the big picture. On the day-to-day -day level, there are problems. Number one, nine years is a long time for an aging, embrittled two reactors that sit at the intersection of a dozen earthquake faults to be running and producing more and more nuclear waste, which we don't know what to do with. So that in itself is a huge issue for Mothers for Peace. It's only by a stroke of luck and who knows why that there hasn't been a terrible earthquake here. And we keep reading all of these articles in the newspapers and published by seismologists saying that the San Andreas Fault is due for the big one. It's wound tighter than it's ever been, just on and on about all the potential. And we've entered into a low sun activity, which corresponds to high earthquake and volcano activity. So there are all these conditions that we have to pay attention to for the next nine years. The other part of this deal is that if you read it, PG&E can bow out of it any time they want. There's nothing binding in the deal for PG&E. So that's another worry because, as you know, PG&E is on trial right now in San Francisco for their San Bruno catastrophe that killed eight people, blew up, what, 38 houses and injured 67 people. Remind us of the nature of that accident. 
PG&E was charged with taking care of the underground pipes for the natural gas, and they were given money from the Public Utilities Commission to take care of those pipes. Instead of using that money to take care of the pipes to keep them in good working order, they used that money and gave it to their senior executives as bonuses. And then, lo and behold, there was a catastrophic explosion that led to this disaster. And ironically, I don't know for sure if these two things are connected, the very day that they made this marvelous announcement about the closure of Diablo Canyon was the very day that their executives went on trial in San Francisco for killing people and causing mayhem in San Bruno. So was it a PR thing? I don't know, but there's something not quite right about the whole way this came down. I would say also just from a pure media perspective that Mm. this was a planned attempt to at least deflect some of the bad publicity and supplant it with something good, even if it is not genuine in intent. Seems like it. Considering San Bruno, that's one aspect of the timing. Another one is that next week, in just a few days from the time that we are speaking, the California State Lands Commission is meeting, and Mm -hmm. there are issues connected to Diablo Canyon that Mm -hmm. are up for consideration there. Bring us up to date on that. The meeting is scheduled for this Tuesday at 10 a.m. in Sacramento and in Morro Bay. And we do hope that anybody who is physically able will show up at one of those meetings. What is going to be discussed at that meeting? That meeting is extremely important because when they built, when they first started thinking about building Diablo Canyon back in 1968 and 1969, that PG&E applied for a land lease out at Diablo Canyon on the what are called the tidelands. That's the area just offshore, but the mean tide line and some distance around that mean tide line. That is where they built the plant, and that is where they have the intake water structure to suck in 2.5 billion gallons of water every day, destroying every single bit of marine life that they suck in with it, which is estimated to be about almost 2 billion fish a year are killed in the larval stage. So they suck it through. It goes through the plant, cools the plant to make it so that it doesn't have a nuclear meltdown. During that time that it's going through the plant, it does pick up bits of radioactive material and then it is pushed back out into the ocean. It's about 20 degrees warmer than it was when it came in, and it has trace amounts of radioactive material that are allowed to be discharged into the ocean every single day. So back in 1968 and 69, PG&E signed a lease with the California State Lands Commission. It was a 49-year lease. By the way, I just found the original lease last night, and it mentions nothing about renewal. There's not a clause in there that talks about renewal. So basically, they are looking at a brand new lease. Those leases expire in 2018 and 2019. And what PG&E and the groups that negotiated the agreement wrote into their agreement is that the State Lands Commission would extend those leases out until 2024 and 2025 without having any kind of environmental review. These leases were signed before there was, everybody sort of the California Environmental Quality Act, which is an act that was signed into law by Ronald Reagan in 1970, and it's the most stringent environmental quality formula that exists in the whole United States. And that's what's referred to sometimes in conversation as the CEQA. Exactly, CEQA. And under CEQA, any proposed project has to write an environmental impact report, an EIR. And so what we say is that these leases are up in 18 and 19. We want the 
State Lands Commission not to automatically renew them for nine more years. What we want them to do is to force, to order PG&E to do a full environmental review of the effects of this facility on the biosphere. That is what CEQA is all about. They could get that CEQA review done in six to nine months if they really put the pedal to the metal. It could be done. We want to look at the, it's a matter of weighing out risk versus benefit. How much risk is there involved in this thing versus how much benefit do we derive? That is what needs to be brought forward into the public consciousness. We're not saying nix the agreement. We are glad, we are happy that this thing is shutting down eventually. But we want to look at the reality of the situation and not just go around, you know, blowing bubbles and saying, yay, it's closing down. And we don't need to look at the environmental consequences of having this monstrosity on our coast. The other part of it is this plant is due to shut down in nine years. There are many, many retrofits that are ordered by the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to all nuclear plants in light of what happened at Fukushima. Trucks that need to be reinforced, all kinds of things. An analogy, I have a car that has 200,000 miles on it. I know I'm going to trade it in for a new car. I find out that my tires are worn and that they need to be replaced. Do I go out and buy four new Michelin tires on this old car? Or do I say, "Mm, I'll just keep an eye on it and I'll take care of it as it goes along. I don't want to invest all that money. Mothers for Peace is very concerned that that's going to be PG&E's attitude about the new tires on the Diablo Canyon power plant. Except if I get into a wreck because I have a blowout in my old car, well, I might hurt myself, I might hurt somebody else, but I would not hurt the entire biosphere with my car wreck. That's the difference between the potential catastrophe that could happen at Diablo Canyon during these nine long years. So basically what we're saying is, okay, you've made a deal with NRDC and Friends of the Earth, great. But we are keeping our eyes on you. You will obey every traffic signal. You will comply with every single order that you're given by the NRC, by the state. You will be subject to critical oversight during this period. And if you don't comply, you have to be shut down now. And that's all there is to it. You've gotten a sweetheart deal. PG&E is coming out of this smelling like a rose, you know, because they're getting so many kudos for replacing Diablo Canyon with renewables. At least that's what they're saying now. But Uh there's many a slip twixt the tongue and the lip. And there's a lot of ways that they can squirrel out of this. I find Uh it fascinating that at the same time that they're announcing the shutdown, employees of theirs are announcing the mothers for nuclear, which is just an oxymoron that blows my brain. Mm -hmm. That is happening. And there's also a lot of other action to create this nuclear is wonderful and make it look like a grassroots campaign. What can you tell us about that? It isn't actually PG&E that's involved in that. It is called the, quote, Breakthrough Institute, but it's funded by radical pro-nuclear people in Chicago. Their main funder is that one of the heiresses of the Hyatt Hotel chain, she's a billionaire, and she is in league with Michael Schellenberger, who calls himself an environmentalist. And I don't quite understand their fanaticism, their pro-nuclear fanaticism, and I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand Maybe they sincerely believe that nuclear is the answer to our climate change problems. If they do believe that, then they are, I don't know, I don't know what they've been smoking, you know, because it costs so much to build a nuclear power plant, number one. Number two, it takes at least 10 years to build a nuclear power plant. 
And number three, nuclear power plants create the worst toxic legacy that anyone has ever imagined could exist on the face of the planet. And so in order to build the number of nuclear power plants that they say they need in order to stop carbon in the atmosphere, maybe they do think that nuclear power is going to save the world from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But in order to do that, Gordon Edwards, a very highly respected uh, nuclear scientist from Canada, estimated that they would have to bring a new nuclear power plant online once a week for the next 10 years. Well, that's plain insane and undoable, even if there weren't the uranium mining, milling, processing, extracting, fabricating, transportation, the huge amounts of carbon that are put into the atmosphere when they're building one of these nuclear power plants. It's all a fantasy. Unfortunately, it's in human nature to want to grab onto a supposed solution to our problems, that we have put ourselves into a very, very complex problem, right smack in the middle of it, that is going to take a tremendous amount of creativity and collaboration in order to get ourselves out of this pickle. And the solution doesn't lie in building new nuclear power plants. It lies in looking at what our real renewable resources are in putting rooftop solar on every house, on every building. It's talking about microgrids and localized power and looking at this system not as a top-down, big industrial company supply power to you, but all of us create our own power. And we've got more than enough ability to do that. Out at Diablo Canyon, they could put in wave power, which they are going to do. That could be put in sooner. They could do solar there. It's so sunny here in California. And I think, I'm not sure that they could do wind. But there are many places in California where wind is a perfect option. So we're looking at the greatest opportunity that this state has ever been given to be the actual world leader in how to get off not only fossil fuels, but nuclear power. We're still going to have the problem of what to do with nuclear waste. That is a problem that does not have a solution. The longer that plant runs, the more waste we're going to have without a solution of where to put it. So it only makes sense. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a nuclear physicist or anything like that, but I am sensible. And it only makes sense to stop making a lethally toxic material if you have no idea what you're going to do with it once you've got it. That is plain crazy that they've allowed that to happen. And there's no solution in sight for that. So so we're living in very interesting times. It's a Chinese curse. It really is. But I'm very grateful that we have this incredible network of people that are putting our heads together and our hearts together to look at this thing, not through rose-colored glasses, but with a clear vision of how we're going to approach You know, we've got this wonderful end in sight. Diablo Canyon will be shut down. In the meantime, we have to keep their feet to the fire. Number one, PG&E's feet to the fire. Keep the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's feet to the fire. Mothers for Peace isn't giving up on the NRC, by the way, because we're the only people who have access to the NRC. We are the official legal intervener in matters pertaining to safety and the environment at Diablo Canyon with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So we're part of all the proceedings at the NRC having to do with Diablo Canyon. There's going to be a lot going on at the NRC between now and 2024, and we will be there with our attorney, Diane Curran. Hopefully, you'll be able to cut down that period of time, either through a ruling by the State Lands Commission Perhaps Mm -hmm. there's an angle with the Coastal Commission. I've heard that there are other possibilities there. But right now we're talking about at the outside, in a non-binding way, PG&E has said they will shut down in eight and nine years. Right. 
but maybe we can move it a little bit sooner. If people who are listening to this show wish to do something to support Mothers for Peace and support the earlier shutdown of Diablo Canyon, what can they do and where can they go? First of all, they can write letters to the State Lands Commission. They are going to be accepting comments, I believe, for 30 days after the meeting about Diablo Canyon. So everybody will have a chance to make their opinions heard. That's number one. Number two, keep up with the issues. Mothers for Peace has a very, very active web page that changes practically daily these days. We will keep people notified about what's going on and where the opportunities lie to get this thing shut down sooner. Mothersforpeace.org. Thirdly, go to Mothers for Peace Facebook page. As things come in, we post them. We post dozens of things every day. We have to remember that we're part of a large, large community of groups, uh, coalitions who are trying to shut down nuclear power all over the world. One reason that the Breakthrough Institute is so interested in keeping Diablo Canyon open is because it's very symbolic all over the world because it was the largest civil disobedience action ever in the history of the entire United States took place at Diablo Canyon over years and years. And then it finally opened and it was thought of as a great win for the pro-nuclear people. But now they're scared that it's going to be a great loss. And it is a great loss for the pro-nuclear power people. So keep in mind that we are all connected with each other. This is a big movement. It's not localized. In order for us to make it through into a sustainable future for our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren and the plants and the animals and other forms of life, we have got to get through this hurdle. If we join with each other and support each other, it's all going to happen more easily, though it won't ever be easy. Truer words were never spoken. That was Linda Seeley of San Luis Obispo, Mothers for Peace. Next, I spoke with Harvey Wasserman, who has been an anti-nuclear pro-alternatives activist for more than 40 years. He writes regularly for a wide Internet readership through EcoWatch, Solartopia.org, FreePress.org, and NukeFree.org, which he also edits. Harvey's articles also appear in Common Dreams, Counterpunch, HuffPost, BuzzFlash, and others, and his Green Power and Wellness show is heard online at prn.fm. Harvey Wasserman and I talked on Saturday, June 25th. Mazel tov with delayed gratification built in. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a good thing to see the idea that Diablo will shut in all the press. I have to say, Libby, this is probably better for the global and national anti-nuclear movement than it is for shutting Diablo. The press has come out. The basic statement says that uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, one of our biggest nuclear utilities, has said that Diablo Canyon can be replaced with renewable energy, and that's a big deal. And it also, we have a, an agreement to shut a nuke that has sign-on from the union, and uh, that's a first. And it, it makes the so-called pro-nuke environmentalists look really silly and, and more marginal than ever. And it casts a big shadow on nuclear power, which, by the way, Brexit, the uh, vote to leave the European Union by Britain, probably has also killed a proposed nuclear plant in England, the Hinkley. It's going to really complicate matters in a situation where they're all already pretty close to going over the cliff. And which one was this in Britain? Hinkley. One of the Hinkley units, and I can't remember what number, but they were going to try and build another one that involved Arriva and the Chinese, and it was really starting to sink into an abyss. It looks like this might push them over, even if they have a revote to rejoin the European Union, which is possible. It's really complicated matters. So these two things are big pluses for us. And if this deal actually results in shutting Diablo, which is unclear at this point, but the template, the whole formula of getting the utility to agree that renewables can replace a nuke, and, you know, they have done that, pg and &E. They have come out and said that. And having the union sign on, 
based on what's called a retain and retrain program where they set aside a ton of money and took it out of the decommissioning plan. But nonetheless, it's a good idea. It all makes the pro-nuke thing even more ridiculous. So on that level, it's a big victory. But with you being in California and me coming there, it's a really mixed bag for Diablo itself. And it's not clear how great it is for shutting Diablo, let's put it that way. There are a number of factors involved here that are not generally discussed. And I do have an article about this, as you know, at ecowatch.com. We will, of course, link to it on the website. Yeah. So, first of all, PG&E is in really deep trouble for many reasons, one of which is they murdered eight people in San Bruno in 2010. They blew up their gas pipeline system, and it was very clear and very well documented that negligence was very much at fault. And so they are in federal court now basically defending themselves on murder charges. The California Public Utilities Commission has already fined PG&E $1.4 billion for that explosion, and we're going to see now what happens in federal court. So this is, in a certain sense, kind of a plea bargain on the part of PG&E, and they're running ads all up and down Northern California saying, you know, we're solar, we're talking about all the solar they're doing and blah, blah, blah. So they really have a big need to clean up their image. Secondly, and this is more important, on June 28th, there will be a hearing in front of the California State Lands Commission on leases that PG&E was given in 1968 and 69. These are really old leases that allow them to continue to operate their cooling systems in state coastal lands. And in 1970, just after these leases were signed, that radical environmental governor, Ronald Reagan, signed the California Environmental Quality Act, which puts forward all sorts of requirements to do something like PG&E is doing at Diablo. Now, they've escaped these requirements for 46 years, but these leases are about to expire in 2017 and 2018. And the Lands Commission is being asked to renew the leases without meeting CEQA, without meeting the environmental impact requirements that are put forward in the California Environmental Quality Act. They're claiming their grandfather. Now what they're going to say, based on this deal, is, well, we're going to close the plants anyway, so don't make us do what CEQA requires us to do. So it's very political. Now, we have a pretty good sense that we're going to win at the State Lands Commission. It's Gavin Newsom, the lieutenant governor, Betty Yee. She's the state controller, and um, a guy named Cohen, who's the chief financial officer. And we were pretty sure that both Betty Yee and Gavin Newsom were going to vote to make PG&E meet CEQA requirements. Now, clearly what the calculation is on the part of PG&E is to go in there and persuade at least these two commissioners to hold off on the requirements. And we don't want them to do that, obviously. We're pretty sure that if these requirements were put in place as a requirement between the leases, the PG&E would have to shut the ABO. So, in other words, got it much sooner than is in their current timeline of eight to nine years. Exactly. Now, I think I'm not positive, and I have not read the agreement, that Friends of the Earth and NRDC, the two groups that negotiated this, along with A4NR, a, capital, a California group, the two big ones, I think, agreed to not oppose their relicensing based on, on avoiding the CEQA. I don't think A4NR signed on to that, but certainly I didn't. And you didn't, and none of the other environmental groups in California signed on to that. The hearing is in Sacramento on June 28th, and it's a big one. I had Linda Seeley on the show two weeks ago to talk about the California Lands Commission meeting that was coming up. This, of course, was before the PG&E announcement. But when you say that these groups, the NRDC and also Friends of the Earth, have negotiated this, who gave them the power and do they honestly represent the interests of the California groups that have been fighting Diablo for so long, such as Mothers for Peace? Well, that's a good question. The Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility was involved with the negotiations. We don't know what they signed on to, or I don't because I haven't read the deal. But I don't think that A4NR signed on to everything that the FOE and NRDC did. You know, they stepped forward and they crafted this agreement, and I'm glad to see the agreement. There's a lot in there that I say that really translates on a global scale, but we don't know really how it's going to impact the situation at Diablo. Clearly, 
allowing Diablo to operate to 2025 is not acceptable. I mean, these reactors are in earthquake zones. We just had testimony from an expert on tsunamis that a tsunami could come and wipe that place out. The reactors themselves are high on a bluff, but the intake, obviously, is at the ocean level, and a tsunami would destroy them and completely deprive the reactors of coolant, which, well, we've seen that before. And that's what happened in Fukushima. Right. So we're not clear here on, on how that plays out. Now, you know, the so-called pro-nuke environmentalists are running around pulling their hair out. <laughs> Talk we're, about we're, your contradiction in terms. Yes, really. They're the ultimate oxymoron here. They hate this, and the industry hates this, primarily for the two reasons I mentioned, which is that it does have a concession by PG&E to say that they could get the power from solar and that the union signed off to a fund. And this template, this model could be applied to all the other reactors in the U.S., hopefully starting with Indian Point, where the Riverkeeper or whatever organizations are there that would be inclined could say, hey, look, this is what they signed on to at Diablo, and let's do this here at Indian Point. And hopefully at Davis Bessie in Ohio and the other reactors around the world. It does make sense in the broader scale, but within California, it's very political, and it really turns not only on the State Lands Commission on June 28th, which will decide on the leases, but the California Coastal Commission and the Water Quality Board and some other state agencies do have the power to require Diablo to to put in cooling towers because right now they're dumping the water 18 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter into the ocean, 2.5 billion gallons a day. It's in direct violation of the state and federal Water Quality Act. Now, if those commissions came forward at a later date, and said, you've got to build cooling towers, pg e will now come back and say, well, we're going to shut in 2025 anyway, so let us go on that. And we don't want that to happen either. And there is precedent for that. A deal like that was cut in New Jersey, where they've allowed Oyster Creek to operate for another seven years. And we don't want that to happen either. The flip side is, if the Coastal Commission and the quality board, the Water Quality Board and other state agencies hold the line and say to pg e you've got to build these cooling towers right away, then it becomes a very interesting situation. Okay, let's flip this around. With the delay as it extends right now for eight to nine years, and this, let's put this in quotes, coincidental emergence, certainly in the media, of a group of people who are calling themselves pro-nuclear environmentalists or activists, which is a ridiculous term, but also we know that many of them trace their roots and their employment back to PG&E. With that coming up as a force, and whatever the -the behind-the-scenes maneuverings are, is there a chance anywhere in this scenario that somehow PG&E will be able to slip out of this timeline of eight to nine years and just continue to run, meaning that this is a delaying tactic on their part to buy time for manipulation. Oh, absolutely. And we have the unfortunate precedent of nuclear operations continuing at Indian Point in New York where licenses have expired. So with PG&E, there's never a contract. You know, you can sign whatever you want to sign, but if they think they can make an extra 25 cents by taking a federal court, they will. And so there's no guarantee here. What they've done is they've damaged the credibility of the industry enormously, which is fine and good. But in terms of the actual shutdown at Diablo, it could be just another manipulation. As concerned activists, me certainly here in California, but there are so many of us who are aware of this and watching it so closely. What can we do to provide the proper support that is going to push PG&E to fulfill not only the eight to nine years, but if the Coastal Commission or any of these other bodies decide that it has to be done sooner, how can we put our support behind that so that they can't whittle out of this one? Well, people should go to the Lands Commission's website, write to Gavin Newsom, write to Betty Yee, write to Mr. Cohen, the three commissioners on the State Lands Commission, and tell them absolutely do not grant this lease without requiring the environmental impact reporting and compliance with CEQA. I mean, you know, CEQA is only 46 years old, for God's sakes. They can't meet 46-year-old environmental standards. What are they doing? 
and then people need to keep focused on the water commission, the coastal commission, the other boards on the cooling tower issue. Nothing changes, really. I mean, the pressure has to go on. All that's happened here is that PG&E has admitted that they can get the power with solar and that a deal could be cut with the unions. So they can't keep griping about, oh, the poor workers are going to lose their jobs. We know now that there is a retain and retrain program that they'll agree to. They can't keep saying, oh, no, we, we can't get the power. They've admitted they can get the power. The question now is, are they going to be forced to meet basic environmental quality standards, both within the CEQA and the water quality laws of the state and federal government? So really, the activist community needs to continue to focus just as we always have. Anything else you can think that you would like to add? Well, this is a great triumph. It's a baby step. You know, it's two steps forward, one step back. But this is a landmark situation because, as I say, they have agreed to a pattern, to a format that will work where all parties can come to agreement to shut a nuclear plant. Now, they're playing around, obviously, with the dates. They're playing around with the license. They're playing around with CEQA. They're playing around with the water quality and many other issues. And the San Bruno trial is a factor. But all these things have come together, and, and it is another step up for us towards a solar-powered, solar-topia, green-powered Earth. And I will continue to contend that Los Angeles will be the world's first solar-topian megalopolis. And this will help us. If we take 2,200 megawatts of power from Diablo Canyon and fill it with renewable energy, it means a lot of those rooftops in L.A. are going to be covered with solar panels. And a lot of those pools are going to be heated with solar panels. And a lot of those homes are going to be taken down in their wires. And uh, we will be transitioning to a renewable-based economy much faster. And this gives us another step forward. It's a definitive step in terms of public relations. And uh, we have to tr- make sure it's also a definitive step in terms of actually shutting those two reactors. So we should celebrate and move ahead. Harvey Wasserman. You can learn more about Harvey's work at solartopia.org. And we'll have several links up to his articles and radio program on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 262. Here's today's final thought, and it's not a happy one. As production was being completed for this week's episode, we received the news that the California Lands Commission has decided not to to make PG&E perform an environmental impact review on Diablo Canyon. No sequa. No nothing. The utility, the reactors, are off the hook. And because there's no binding nature to the agreement made by Friends of the Earth and Natural Resources Defense Council with PG&E, Despite all the PR announcements, the whoop-de-doo, and the media picking up the story, there is no guarantee that the utility won't figure out a way to extend the license on those two nuclear reactors or run without one for whatever made-up reasons they choose. For the record, Mothers for Peace was not a party to this agreement, despite the decades of gut-crushing work that they have done to shut that pair of nuclear reactors down. Hope and heartbreak. Hope and heartbreak. That's the nuclear news cycle. Such hopes that we had for getting Diablo Canyon shut down for real, maybe even by 2019. And then today's crushing blow. I guess a billionaire's billions can buy a lot of politicians and rustle up a whole bunch of muscle. What really hurts right now, and that I take personally, is that the headlines jamming the news cycle right now read, Activists oppose closing nuclear site in nine years. Excuse me, journalists, if you dare to call yourself that. Those were not activists. They were tourists, bust in bought and paid for by billionaires who play their games with our lives and laugh all the way to the bank because they've got it rigged so they never lose, and their bank accounts just keep getting bigger. I really thought we had a chance this time, that reason and common sense would win out. But how foolish of me. This is nuclear.
Nothing makes sense except greed, manipulation, lies, fraud, viciousness, psychosis, and the progressive destruction of our biosphere. My condolences to Linda Seeley, Jane Swanson, and all the great genuine activists who worked so hard on this matter. We was robbed. As for me, I feel like smashing a bunch of s'mores all over those smug pro-nuclear faces. Let's get them next time. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 28, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, calcoastnews.com, fukuleaks.org, San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, independent.com, Seed Coalition and Karen Hayden, vtdigger.com, artvoice.com, tri-cityherald.com, cbslocal.com, dailymail.co.uk, japantimes.co.jp, Fukushima Dash Diary and our friend Iori Mochizuki, jharrod.oxfordjournal.org, miningawareness.wordpress.com, dailymail.co.uk, spokesman.com, the s'mores-faced assholes at World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the elegant, informed, powerful, motivated, and extremely good-looking activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat who gather on our Facebook site to share their insights and observations, and which you are all invited to come visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and now broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. If you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, shoot, if you've got a website and you want a link to the show, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com and we will make this happen. You can also check out our archive of 261 shows on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. They are also on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos and on iTunes under Podcasts. If you sign up on the website to receive notice and link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode, as a bonus, you will receive a chapter from my ebook. Yes, I glow in the dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. The full ebook is available on Amazon, and I promise I will get to writing it out and make it a book book this year, she said. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat, the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016. Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating. Reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded in 112 countries. We are international. This movement and those of us in it are not alone. And we are linking because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So nobody go back to sleep because we are all truly in the Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat. What are those people thinking? New Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.